Okay, so today is lecture number six, and I will be talking about DNA replication and repair for the fourth time. This is the final lecture on replication and repair, and then we move on to new topics from the next week. So we've talked about every single thing mentioned here, and now we're going to talk about like what what are the other repair mechanisms. So we're going to focus on repair today and a few other things. So topics covered in this lecture. We'll talk about eukaryotic origins of repair. So we discussed origins of repair in prokaryotes in the last lecture. This time we'll talk about how yeasts have here yeah, the origins of replication and how humans and mammals have them. Then we'll talk about how a replication is controlled. Then we'll come back down to nucle nucleosome duplication because uh, in eukaryotes, at least in humans and or mammals, your chromosome is made up of almost equal parts of DNA as well as protein. So epigenetics and histones plays a huge, huge role in uh, in your chromosome and how it's expressed. So therefore, you need to duplicate your nucleosomes and other epigenetic marks. Then we'll talk about telomere replication and we'll talk about what telomeres actually are. So this is something which is highly implicated in the development of cancer and aging related disorders. Then we'll talk about how telomere length is regulated in a cell. And then finally, we'll talk about DNA repair. So like these are mechanisms outside of replication. So we've discussed uh, base uh, repairing of the DNA in context of replication. This will be independent of uh, rep the context of replication. So what happens if there are spontaneous, what, what if there's a spontaneous damage? And then we'll talk about these two mechanisms of repair. Then we'll talk about the chemical perspective of how it is somewhat easy to repair DNA. Then we'll talk about double-stranded breaks. So DSBs are double-stranded breaks. And then we'll talk about the effect of DNA repair mechanisms on the cell cycle. So first, we'll talk about the eukaryotic origins of replication. So firstly, mutant cells of mutant yeast cells were used to determine the origins of replication. So imagine, uh, imagine a yeast cell and think of uh, think of any any gene essential for survival. So it could be so here in this case, it's the uh, his gene. The his gene is important for survival because these mediums, these two plates shown, are med selective mediums without histidine. So you have made mutant yeast cells. So each of these cells is a mutant cell which lacks the ability to make histidine on its own and it cannot obtain it from the environment because the environment has no histidine. So I'm describing the experiment right now. So you have a cell which needs something. It can usually make it, but you removed the gene that allows this process to occur. And you removed all instances of it obtaining it from the environment because the medium is deficient of that specific thing. In this case, histidine. You remove the histidine gene. It cannot make histidine. You remove the histidine from the environment. It cannot obtain histidine through absorption or other methods. So, and then, okay now. Now you have plasmids. So plasmids are extra chromosomal genetic material which, which is replicating independently of the genome. So I hope most of you know what plasmids are. And plasmids can be used to introduce genes to mutant cells. And they used these plasmids to introduce the histidine gene back into the cell. And so, so introducing a gene is not, is not enough. You need this gene to express as well. So and these can't express independently in uh, without origins of replication and other factors. And then in, in another part of the plasmid, they inserted various regions of uh, various parts of the genome of yeast and figured out which part allows the replication, allows the expression of this plasmid to occur, allows the replication of this plasmid to occur. And regions, regions where the uh, the replication of the plasmid was confirmed was occurring those regions were thought to be the autonomously replicating sequences or the origins of replication so this plasmid has no origins of replication anywhere and and they inserted another part of the genome of the yeast to figure out which part of the genome is essential for originating replication so only in parts which contain the origin of replication, you will see survival of cells. Because in other cases, this plasmid would not be able to replicate. It would go to one or two cells and they would form a few colonies. But you need, but you need this to be able to replicate itself 
otherwise it will not pass on to the progeny in this case it did not pass on to the progeny because it did not have an origin of replication and therefore it cannot multiply itself in this case it it did have an origin of replication it could replicate and distribute itself among all the progeny cells therefore you see a nice distribution of colonies on the plate i hope it's clear so this was the experiment which uh, which they used to uh, determine which which sites of the genome are important for replication and yes ars ars is autonomously replicating site or sequence so the cells lacking the essential gene are supplemented with a plasmid so this gene is being supplemented because they lack the his gene cells that survived had the specific replication origin to allow the expression so these ones survived therefore whatever you added here must be important for the origin of replication that's how their thought process was if if this region did not contain the ars sequence it would be just like this case and not a lot of cells would survive but if it did have the origin of replication a lot of cells would survive a lot of progeny would survive so loss of uh, so this is an extra point the loss of a few origins does not affect the yeast too much so if you have say mutations or deletions in the genome the loss of a few origins will not affect the uh, organism much but loss of many origins will lead to loss of the entire chromosome in the progeny if a lot of origins are missing from a certain chromosome it will not be able to replicate itself in time to be passed on to the progeny imagine you have three three chromosomes just this is just a hypothetical number imagine you have three chromosomes and you have this one cell replicates in 20 minutes it takes 20 minutes for each chromosome to replicate and all of this is occurring simultaneously so by the time replication is done your cell cycle would have progressed enough to split so you have two cells again with three and three chromosomes each because the replication time matched with the generation time what if you remove half of the origins on chromosome number 3 you had three chromosomes on chromosome number 3 you had say 10 origins out of these 10 origins you removed five so now you have removed a lot a significant chunk of the origin of replication in the third chromosome so uh, hypothetically its replication time has gone up from 20 minutes to now it's 40 minutes it now takes 40 minutes to replicate chromosome number 3 therefore when the cell cycle starts when the dna replication begins only chromosome number 1 and 2 will be passed on to the progeny cells chromosome number 3 will not have completed its replication to be able to be passed on if it if it does not complete replication it does not have two copies to give one to the daughter that's why loss of too many origins will lead to loss of the entire chromosome from the progeny it will not replicate fast enough to be passed on i'll stop here because this is this is quite tense this is not something that we've done before if you have any questions please put them in the chat okay two people are typing nice <clears throat> yeah one of the daughter cells still has the chromosome the other one does not get it so the question was one of the daughter cells will get it and the other won't and yes one daughter cell will get it and the other won't what about chromosomes of different size won't that also affect the time taken to replicate but if chromosomes are larger or smaller the number of uh, origins of replication would also differ here we talked about a case where all three were similar but if you have say a larger chromosome you would have more origins of replication there so the number of replication sites would increase great so let's move on now we'll talk about the control of replication that occurs in eukaryotes so eukaryotic origins of replication are quite different from the prokaryotic origins of replication because uh, so first of all the major difference is it is not as specific as the prokaryotic replication sites origins of replication so prokaryotic origins of replication are extremely specific sites they have a very they have very precise sequence and the the protein binding binding to it is extremely precise 
in mammals and uh, eukaryotes it is not as precise it's it's kind of loose so the origins of replication are binding sites for orc orc is the origin recognition complex they are 80 rich sequences in the last lecture we discussed why 80 rich sequences because the adenine and thymine have only two bonds so it's easier to break them than guanine and cytosine hydrogen bonds they are binding sites for proteins that attract ORCs. So they can attract other proteins which will attract an ORC, sorry, an ORC. That can also happen. The OR, so, uh, well, it's not ORC complex. <laughs> it would be redundant to say ORC complex. Anyway, ORC once bound to the origin of replication is sequentially activated and deactivated. You don't, once it's bound, you want it to deactivate as well because once it's bound, it will continue to keep replicating your the specific sequence and you don't want that to happen you want some level of control so you want it to deactivate once once its job is done origins in humans are not as specific and these can be determined so we talked about how by plasmid mutation studies you could uh, sorry plasma transformation studies you could detect the origin of replication in yeasts in humans what you can do is uh, recombination studies but recombination is not something we've done till now, so I will not discuss that process. So let's see how the association and dissociation of the ORC is important for control. So you have, so this is the G1 phase and this is the S phase. So the S phase is where actual replication occurs. G1 phase, the G1 phase is where you have all the preparation required. So you have the binding of ORC to the origin. And then you have other protein molecules coming in, and which will which will uh, which will get the helicase to join to the DNA strands. And these proteins will ensure that the helicase loader. So helicases have helicase loaders, and if you remember from last lecture, helicase loaders have one more job of keeping the helic helicase inactive. So these proteins, these two proteins you see here, there are many more. Let's not get into the naming of them. That's not uh, required at this level. So that they will remove the helicase loading protein and activate the helicase once it's loaded onto the uh, onto the DNA strands. And then you have the leaving of your uh, or ORC um, proteins and DNA replication begins. So what happens is there's a pre-replicative complex which is formed in the G1 phase. So you could call this a pre-replicative complex, pre-RC. So this is your pre-RC complex. This occurs in the G1 phase. In the G1 phase, you have the uh, you have the making of the pre-RC. When the CDK levels are low, passage of cell from G1 to S phase. So these are mitotic uh, the phases of mitosis. Passage of cell from the G1 to S phase marks an increase in CDK activity. So if you notice, this is the graph for cyclins. And it's increasing once you move from G1 to S. There's a slight increase. In G1 phase, it's almost negligible, leading to the dissociation of the helicase loading protein. In the G1 phase, you have the pre-replicative complex. The helicase is still inactive. When, when CBK levels go up, so cyclin-dependent kinase, these are kinases, and these can phosphorylate the, the proteins to make them leave and activate some proteins so phosphorylation the effect of phosphorylation is dependent on the protein itself some proteins are deactivated by phosphorylation some proteins are activated by phosphorylation so it depends on the protein so you have cdk mediated phosphorylation which will activate some um, proteins which are say it will lead to the removal of certain proteins and activation of certain others that's why an increase in cdk activity leads to the dissociation of helicase loading protein. The CDKs, they have also uh, one more job. Once the CDKs are active, once you are in the S phase, you don't want the pre-replicative complex forming somewhere else or once the replication is done here to form again in this region. That You don't want that to happen. You don't want multiple levels of replication occurring in one cell cycle. You just want it to replicate once to perform two daughter strands and that's it you want it to stop there so cdk's prevent formation of new pre-replicative complexes until the next m phase so and once the m phase is over 
your uh, the pre-replicative complexes can form again at these origins. But like from moving from S phase to M, uh, M phase, it cannot happen again. So you don't, you only want two daughter strands. You don't want four or eight. So that's how. So this is a very, very basic overview of how uh, your DNA replication is is maintained over replication cycles or cell division cycles rather. So now let's talk about nucleosome duplication. So what are nucleosomes? We discussed this uh, quite a few lectures ago that nucleosomes uh, are histone molecules around which DNA is wrapped. Histone molecules are, uh, is an, histone is an octamer formed of H1, uh, H, not H1 technically, H2 dimer, H3 and H4. So H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. H1 is a sort of a long straight molecule which is not a part of the of the core helix. Uh, sorry, it's not a part of this of this core molecule. It's somewhere attached around this region, H1. So it's not considered part of the core molecule. Anyway, histones are mainly synthesized in the S phase. So the synthesis of histones is correlated with DNA replication. S phase is where DNA replication is occurring. S phase DNA replication. So histone uh, synthesis also occurs in the S phase. So it's kind of it goes hand in hand. So when a nucleosome is transited by the replication fork, the histone octamer is broken. So once the replication fork has passed these uh, nucleosomes, the octamer is broken. The H3, H4, the green ones are H3 and H4. The H3, H4 stay back and the H2A and H2B leave. So H2A, H2B dimers are left, like they are free floating around. But the H3 and H4 uh, molecules stay attached to the nucleosomes, incomplete nucleosomes now. For this, for all of this to occur, you need chromatin remodelers. So chromatin remodelers allow the removal of dimers and the distribution of H3, H4. So if you notice, uh, this is an empty uh, nucleosome, this is an empty nucleosome, this is an empty nucleosome, this is an empty nucleosome. You need the addition. So it was one strand earlier. So all of this was one strand. So these H, so imagine there were six nucleosomes and now there are 12 nucleosomes. So you, you only have six units of H3, H4 tetramers. So only six of them can be distributed but you have 12 sites. So how does that happen? You have some empty nucleosomes where histone chaperones can add new molecules of H3, H4, H2A and H2B. You have histone chaperones which bring and fill in the gaps. So these, this is a gap which is filled in by, uh, which is uh, filled in by histone chaperones which are synthesizing a new H3, H4 dimer, tetramer, sorry. This is also a gap which has been filled in by histone chaperones. So you see the gaps are filled in soon and the remaining gaps here, the H2A, H2B gaps, those are also filled in by separate histone chaperones. So histone molecules, that's how histone molecules are passed on to the daughter strand. This is the parental strand. These two are the daughter strands. And now the daughter strands are also uh, containing the histone molecules. That's how it's been tra transmitted. So if you notice that uh, parental strands have uh, these histone molecules which can have epigenetic modifications on them. So these are parental nucleosomes with modified histones. And once you have a DNA replication, you have two daughter DNA strands, half of them, so half of the newer histones are parental in origin and half of them are new in origin. So the blue marks are the parental origin histone and the ones without the marks are the new ones. So these haven't been marked yet. So only half of the daughter nucleosomes have modified histones. If you notice here, only half of them stayed. Half of them stayed here, half of them stayed here. The other half have to be synthesized again. So this new half will not have the older marks. So uh, I talked about this, I think in the second or the third lecture that histone uh, nucleosomes and the histone molecules on them have, have histone tails and these histone tails are protruding out of the molecule 
which can be modif modified by post-translational modifications. These can be acetylations, methylations, ubiquitinations and whatnot. So all of these modifications are necessary for epigenetic information. So epigenetics is a course we will be starting soon. So if you haven't if you haven't enrolled for that, please do. So it will be a lot more clearer once we talk about the epigenetics of the entire process. So anyway, right now you have a certain number of modified histones. Half of them go to each daughter strand and the other half is new and unmarked. And then you have, uh, so you need to re-establish these histone, histone marks. So you have certain uh, protein enzymes that come in that recognize these old marks that are binding to this mark. They recognize, oh, this one has a certain mark, a blue mark, and then it marks this histone as well, this nucleosome as well. That's how histone marks are passed between generations. You have certain, uh, pro certain enzymes which recognize older marks, recognize these marks, oh, it has this, this position has a methylation, and then they go to the histones which do not have the modification and add it to them. So these are reader-writer complexes because it's reading what histone marks were there and writing it on the ones which are blank. So I'll stop for questions here. This can get quite confusing. If you have any questions, please ask them. Do not hesitate. Okay. Okay, someone's typing. <clears throat> Sorry. If you still have any questions, like after this question is done, I'll still take questions. So if you have them, please ask. I hope the part where the distribution of uh, histone molecules is clear between parental strands and daughter strands. I couldn't get why there were M3 nucleosomes. Okay, imagine this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So imagine there's a 6th one here. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Imagine there's a 6th one here. So there are 6 sites here and 6 sites here. Right? So that's a total of 12 sites on the two daughter DNA. But the parental DNA only had six. And now there are 12. So you have three on each strand which will get passed on. Imagine you had six nucleosomes earlier, but after replication, you now have 12 nucleosomes. But you only have enough histones for six of them. So three go to one strand and three go to the other strand. Half, half, half. So out of the six here, only three are occupied. And out of the six here, only three are occupied. And once or so, and then you have other chaperones coming in to fill in the empty spaces in both of these daughter. These are newly synthesized daughter strands. And this, so this would have, these two would have been one strand earlier. Okay, there's another question. These reader writer complexes were involved even in the nucleosome modification part and like euchromatin to heteroconversion, right? It is because DNA is double stranded and there are six nucleosomes happening that double stranded DNA, what once it separates becomes single stranded, so three each. It doesn't become single stranded. DS DNA always forms DS DNA. That's the entire point of replication. Single stranded DNA molecules will not survive. And reader writer uh, complexes are definitely involved in histone modification as we are seeing right now. Euchromatin to hetero, yes. Euchromatin to heterochromatin conversion happens because of these histone marks. Anyway, so I think that's about it for the questions. Oh, it's still typing. Okay, great.
then we'll talk about telomere replication so what is a telomere a telomere is uh, basically a repeating sequence at the end of the chromosomes so these are tandem repeats sh uh, which of short length and they, these are similar uh, across uh, across org organisms of all kinds and they are replica uh, like repeated again and again so you have thousands of these repeated one after the other and you have okay so now we'll talk about end replication problem so the end replication problem occurs because of semi discontinuous synthesis so what is semi discontinuous synthesis we know that the lag, uh, leading strand synthesis is continuous and we've discussed uh, uh, in the two lectures earlier that the lagging strand synthesis is semi discontinuous it needs to uh, step back and replicate and then move back again and then replicate so it's kind of like a stepper replication so what this leads to is now you remember that there's a three prime end required for replication so it your dna polymerase cannot replicate from this five prime five prime end in this way it cannot replicate it needs a three prime end it cannot replicate from a five prime end what what it would have normally done was uh, it would have added a new primer here and then replicated it this way that would make sense if you add a primer here imagine this primer is being added now you have a free three prime end and you can replicate this blank region but once at the end and once you reach the end of the telomere there is not enough space to add a regular primer there's no space for a regular primer you can add uh, so you need some other enzyme to replicate these telomeres and this enzyme is called a telomerase what this does is it can add a random uh, template with a free three prime end so this one does not so the uh, rna primer it creates telomerase creates it does not there has to be no specific sequence for it as long as it binds to one or two nucleotides at the end your dna polymerase does not care about this sequence your dna polymerase will look at this sequence and synthesize correctly here right that makes sense DNA polymerase does not care about primer sequence. We have discussed this earlier as well. Primer sequence is irrelevant because primers are degraded anyway. You just want a free three prime end to continue uh, replication. So this is uh, this is a problem seen in eukaryotes a lot. Does anyone know why bacteria does, do not have the end replication problem? someone's typing <clears throat> but, so yeah yeah prokaryotic uh, bacterial dna is circular so there is no end to worry about but in eukaryotes you have linear dna and therefore you have certain ends of chromosomes which you need to worry about so eukaryotes solve this problem by using telomeres and telomeres are are non coding regions so loss of telomere is not important for the uh, survival of the organism so you can lose uh, telomeres throughout your lifetime and in fact you actually are each of your cells whenever they divide they are losing some some part of the telomeres at the end and that's this is one uh, theory as to why old age occurs because once the telomeres have run out your once the telomere shortening once the telomeres the region which can be shortened the buffer region has run out your actual genes will start getting shortened and once your genes start getting shortened you will have lots of problems so this is the telomere and if this starts getting shortened little by little each cell division it does not matter but once your actual genes start getting shortened it can uh, shorten it can lead to a lot of problems so this is the ggg tta is the sequence of telomeres in humans so this is your telomerase enzyme your telomere dna sequences are recognized by sequence specific dna binding proteins so these are dna binding proteins which can recognize telomeric sequences and once they bind to the telomere they can attract the telomerase so once proteins uh, so these are attractor proteins and once they bind to the telomeres 
they will tell the telomer telomerase to come to them and bind to the DNA sequence. Then what the telomerase will do? It will uh, create a new uh, template. So it will bind to here. It will bind to the lagging uh, on the side of the lagging strand, and it will increase the length of the leading strand. So it's kind it's quite opposite. You would imagine that if it just left this sequence attached, this three prime end could be replicated with ease, and no need to extend this first. So first this is extended. And then you have another primer coming in to uh, replicate everything else. If it just left this blue sequence, there would be no problem. But what happens is this, this sequence is directly a part of the telomerase. So the telomerase has a permanent, uh, like this, this primer is permanently attached to the telomerase. And first you increase the length of the parental leading strand once this length has increased you add a regular primer here a regular dna primer is added and then you have dna polymerase replicating the rest of this stretch i hope this process is clear if you have any questions please ask them it can get quite confusing to understand If telomeres are being synthesized with every replication, then how is there a DNA loss? I'll come to that. I'll come to that part. Okay, is there any other question? Like, is this process clear? You increase the length of the leading strand and then you synthesize the lagging strand. Okay, so the enzymatic portion of the telomerase is very similar to a reverse transcriptase. So what a reverse transcriptase does is it makes DNA sequences out of RNA sequences. So this is just a very interesting point that the telomerase active site resembles a reverse transcriptase active site. So this, so you have the, uh, the lengthening of your uh, of the lagging strand with the use of extra primers and stuff. Along with that, you also have a five prime nuclease that ensures that the three prime end at the telomerase, the telomere is always longer. So after all this is done, you have a five prime, uh, you have a five prime nuclease, which will cut down on this region. So after this is synthesized, some of it will be cut to ensure that the three prime end is always longer. So why do you think there's a difference in length here? Like in the first place, why is there even a difference in length? Because of the five prime nuclease. If these two, uh, in the if in, in the parental strand, if these two were of the equal length, you would not be able to add a uh, length to the leading strand. You would not be able to add length to this region if it was equal. Imagine if the if these two ended right here, if these two were equal, where would this sequence bind? It would not have a spot to bind. It needs some overhang to bind to. You need to ensure one strand is always longer. That's why there's a loss of telo telomere length at each replication cycle because of the five prime nuclease. And this protrusion, so this is the actual image of a protrusion. This prot protrusion forms a T loop. You can't, once you have an overhang, you can't leave it alone in the cell. The cell will think it's a DNA damage and will start repairing it. So this loops around itself. This one will loop, uh, bind to itself, loop around, and will prevent the degradation of itself by forming a T loop. So this is an electromicrograph with artificial uh, enhancement of the DNA. So the DNA molecule is not actually this thick. They use silver silver atoms or something. I'm not sure about the entire process, but it has been artificially thickened, and an image has been taken. Is overhang ever expressed? No. These are non-coding regions. Okay, so now we'll talk about how is telomere length regulated. So these, so the uh, stepper, look, I think we'll see the rectangles drawn here. All of these are telomeres. And this is a short telomere and this is a long telomere with many repeats. 
5 prime nucleus works from 5 prime to 3 prime, right? Yes, it cuts down. So the 5 prime end is always shorter, if you notice. Okay, so the telomere length is proposed as a possible counting mechanism to avoid endless replication. So what if you had 10 molecules of telomerase, uh, telomeres, once you are a new cell, and with each replication, imagine you lose now one telomere with each replication. So what will happen as you grow older? After 10, 10 cycles of replication, you will have shortening of your regular DNA. So this, uh, so this allows the cell to know, oh, this cell has replicated 10 times because its genome has no telomeres left. And this can lead to replicative cell senescence. So that's one proposed mechanism as to how a cell would know that it's time to die. I have replicated too many times. Replicating after this will lead to loss of chromosome, which can lead to other sorts of things. So you don't want loss of genome. So once it's at the end of the telomere length, it will start killing itself, apoptosis, or it won't divide anymore and just die out. So what they did was, so, so th this was an experiment done on yeast. And they artificially enhanced the length of telomeres. And in one cell line, they artificially reduced the length of a telomere. And what they noticed was the cells, after a few replication cycles, always got it to a median level. So if it was short, it got it back to the median level again. If it was too long, it got it back to the median, le median level. So this is fine in yeasts. Because yeasts don't have to worry about cancers. It's a single-celled organism. It's not a multicellular organism which has to worry about cancer and stuff. Us humans are multicellular. We don't want uncontrolled replication, unlike bacteria and single cell, other single-celled organisms. They can replicate as much as they want. They don't have to worry about cancer and over-replication. So they can always bring... So they have... Telo, so an enzyme called telomerase is what regulates the length of telomeres and in stem cells and in cells which continue which need to be replicated throughout your lifetime you have telomerase expression in those cells in germ cells in primordial germ cells in stem cells you have the you have the uh, the expression of the telomerase enzyme what a telomerase does it it restores the length of the telomere it doesn't less, let the loss to occur but in regular somatic cells, which do not have to be passed down to the next generation. So your skin cells, your neurons, your blood cells, none of these are passed on to your progeny. So it doesn't matter if these have the telomerase acting or not. And therefore, you have them turned off. You want somatic cells to die. You don't want stem cells to die. You want your skin cells to die off one day so it can be replaced by other skin cells. But you don't want your stem cells to die. You want your stem cells to survive and to keep producing other differentiated cells. That's why you have telomerase the gene activated in certain cells and deactivated in most somatic cells. If you have an artificial uh, reactivation of the telomerase gene, you could see uh, increasing incidences of tumors and cancers. So this might occur. So how do they know the importance of the telomerase enzyme? So what they did was they uh, they pro they produced a mouse cell line, not a cell line, sorry, a mouse uh, line in which it was the the initial mouse was mutated for the telomerase gene. So telomerase gene was artificially removed or silenced in the in the parent parental mouse strains, not strains, sorry, not bacteria. In the parental mouse and the progeny they produced also lacked the telomerase gene so once you have knocked it out in the parents none of the children will get it so after so if you did this in humans if say uh, if like it's it would be extremely unethical and no one would uh, do this experiment but say if you had to do it on humans if you remove the telomerase gene from one parent and you allowed them to reproduce and produce children so the children would also lack the telomerase gene. And if they lack the telomerase gene, they would see a, a very high incidence of cancer and other replication disorders. So I don't think they would even be a viable embryo. Anyway, so they did this in mice. 
and after a few generations they started seeing effects so you did not see the effects as rapidly as you would see in humans in humans if you remove the telomerase gene you would see its action within one generation but it takes 3 to 4 generations for the mice to show similar effects because mice have longer telomere lengths than humans do if humans had 1000 repeats mice would have 3000 to 4000 repeats so these are hypothetical numbers anyway it would take 3 or 4 generations for the uh, mice telomeres to get shortened to a level where it would affect the genome and what happens so once it has once the telomeres have shortened enough what you would see is that these progeny mice aged much faster they showed aging related disorders right from the childhood they showed a very high incidence of cancer so therefore the telomerase gene therefore is very essential for uh, your maintenance of replication cycles okay now we'll move on to dna repair before we start dna repair is, are there any questions all good that's great uh, because this part part can get quite uh, complicated telom telomeres are hard to understand but if you do understand then that's great now we'll talk about dna repair and so we talked about errors which can occur during replication oh wait someone's typing i'll just wait for a second <coughs> it's difficult Oh yeah, definitely. It's given quite well in the textbooks, but if you still need extra reading material, I can always provide that. Okay, telomerase shortening. I uh, definitely. I'll I'll link some videos in the the required reading post I make. Anyway, um, we'll talk about spontaneous damage now. Earlier we talked about in the last lecture we talked about what DNA errors can occur during replication. So there were replication errors. and there are there can be errors in the dna besides replication as well spontaneous damage which can be depurination oh sorry this is spelling mistake it's depurination d e depurination deamination dimerization uh, attack from reactive oxygen species that's why they keep saying antioxidants are important antioxidants are important because antioxidants can reduce or uh, oxidative damage so you have certain a uh, reactive oxidative species ros and these ros can damage your dna because these are highly highly reactive and these ros can be deactivated by antioxidants so that's why antioxidants are quite the hype these days anyway each of these arrows shows an area where you can cause damage the dna in a spontaneous fashion you can break the carbon carbon bonds you can break the bonds between the uh, base and the sugar you can remove double bonds you can uh, you can methylate stuff you can remove methyl groups you can remove amine groups there's a lot of damage that can be done to your genome for example depurination depurination is removal of a purine so purines are adenine and guanine and these can be removed completely and you have no base left here anymore you can have deamination so deamination will be lead to the removal of your amine group and amine group is an nh3 group and this group is removed and replaced with an oxygen and this is uracil now if you remember uracil is not a part of dna uracil is a part of rna and uracil base pairs to a cytosine base pairs to g so if you have this spontaneous change occurring your base pairing is is gone for a toss so this this is how damage can cause cha permanent changes okay not permanent changes but damaging changes in the genome and let's see how it affects replication so you have a deaminated c so this is c is cytosine and once you have deamination of cytosine you form uracil so deamination of c forms uracil and uracil does not bind to g uracil only base pairs with a but he has he has a g so what happens is if if you replicate this strand so this is the old strand this is the new strand uracil will will base pair to a this is a mutation it was this was a gc base pair 
and now it's an AU base pair. G has been changed to A. The other strand will remain unchanged. So one strand is still normal. You have the G, it will base pair to C normally. This is your, uh, this is a non-mutated dotted DNA, but this one is definite, sorry, is definitely mutated. What about depurination? So we uh, saw how depurination is just complete removal of the base. So this base, it does not exist anymore. And if you have uh, DNA replication, this strand, this is the old strand here, would only form three other base pair pods. It will only form three base pairs, A, G, A. This, this T, A base pair got deleted. The A, T nucleotide has been deleted. So this will lead to a deletion mutation. And on the other strand, it will be unchanged because one strand is still undamaged. The other strand, because of semi-conservative replication, will lead to some sort of a mutation. Uh, in the case of deamination, it leads to uh, G, guanine changing to an adenine. In the case of depurination, it can lead to complete de deletion of that base pair. So how these mutations are bad and other specific kinds of mutation, I'll talk in a more advanced lecture. Right now, like we'll just keep it to the basics right now. So how do you repair these damages? So you have multiple mechanisms for repair. One mechanism is the base excision repair. So what this name tells you, so excision means to remove something, to cut out something. And base excision repair means it removes a base. It cuts out a specific base. So this will remove one base and fix it. This is your entire process. It involves glycosylases and AP endonucleases. So these are names of enzymes which are important for the process. Right now, I just want you to focus on the process. The names are not very important. I want you to understand the basics of them first. So it works in a flipping out manner. So how does it check where there's a where, where's the error? So it does that by flipping each base out. So this is just one base which has been shown flipped out. So all the regular bases are base paired towards the center. One of them is flipped out and checked. So they check. That's how it checks. It flips it out and checks it. Now. Once you have deamination of cytosine, you form a uracil. And uracil does not base pair properly with G. So uracil DNA glycosylase, so the first enzyme glycosylase, this is the one that does the flipping out checking. So glycosylase will flip out this nucleotide, check and see, oh, it's a uracil. It's not supposed to exist in the DNA. It will remove the uracil. Now you have a DNA helix, which is missing one base. And then you have the AP endonuclease. So an endonuclease is a nuclear. A nuclease is any enzyme which cuts your DNA, a nucleic acid. And an endonuclease means it cuts in the in between a uh, nucleic acid chain. An exonuclease, EXO, exonuclease would cut from the ends. An endonuclease can cut from the middle. So that's how the nomenclature works. Endo meaning inside, it cuts on the inside. So you have the removal of this specific sugar phosphate backbone and then DNA polymerase can come and fix this gap. So it's very easy to fix this gap. It will see, oh, it's a G here. It needs to add a C. So it's a very simple fix once the thing has been removed. So it's kind of an indirect repair. It never repaired the damaged G, uh, C, sorry. The C was damaged to form uracil. It never repaired the damage. It just cut it out and added a new nucleotide. So the chemical damage was never repaired. Now we'll talk about nucleotide excision repair. This was base excision repair. It removed one specific base and repaired it. Nucleotide excision repair removes a whole sequence of nucleotides, so about 10 to 12, and it fixes the entire gap. So this one was for very specific singular changes. This can be used for bigger changes so it repairs larger changes in the structure of the, the double helix and it scans for distortion and not specific bases so it, like, like the glycosylases the the enzymes involved in nucleotide excision repair ner and this is ber so the enzymes involved in ner 
do not care about individual bases they will come they will scan retro so they will scan the entire genome and then they look for distortions they will look for large scale distortions they don't care about individual base pairing it scans for bigger distortions and so a pyrimidine dimer is a distortion pyrimidine dimers are formed due to uv radiation so that's why they keep saying you need to protect yourself from uv radiation because uv radiation can lead to dimerization of pyrimidines pyrimidines have thymine and cytosine in uh, dna and it can form tt dimers ct dimers or cc dimers although tt thymine dimers are the most common but there can be other pyrimidine dimers as well tt is the most common but there are others as well so this is also a way of indirect repair although you had a dimerization here it never repaired the dimerization it just cut around the dimerization removed the entire sequence this damage is still there but it has been removed now and this gap will be filled in by dna polymerase and dna ligases so this is your regular replication based on the template strand we've talked about this anyway both of these ber and ner both of these are indirect ways to repair dna because they never technically repair they just remove it and add a new one but an alternative is di direct dna repair so what what do you do in direct dna repair is you directly directly repair the dna damage you don't cut it out and add a new one you see what the damage is and then you repair it and so in humans at least what happens is the dna rep repair mechanisms are highly coupled with transcription so so dna damage what does dna damage mean if you have dna damage you have a change sequence of nucleotides if your nucleotide, nucleotide sequence has changed you will have a changed mrna sequence so transcription is used to produce mrna from dna and this mrna can translate into proteins so dna to rna to proteins and proteins are what cause changes in your body proteins are the final product which can create any sort of change in your body so if you have a change in the dna sequence you will have a change in the rna sequence mrna sequence and if you have a change in the mrna sequence you will have an altered protein expression so this altered protein could be an inactive protein you could have a protein which does not perform its job if it's an enzyme even a single single change in the dna base pairing can cause changes in the protein and it won't function properly if it was a tumor suppressor gene so tumor suppressors control the rate of growth of your cell if you have dna uh, mutation in a tumor suppressor gene the the products of this gene the protein products will not act as well and then your tumor suppression has gone haywire you won't be able to suppress any tumors that form this can lead to cancer so that's why you need to ensure that your dna sequence does not allow for mutations so the most important place where you can check for mutations is right before transcription so while transcription is occurring dna re repair machinery is actively scanning that region so there are non coding sequences in dna i i hope everyone knows this not all of your dna is important well in some way it's important but not all of your dna forms protein only small part of your dna forms protein and this small part so we need to ensure that this small part does not undergo any changes the larger regions can go under, undergo changes because those never form proteins so transcription the act, the genes which are active which are actively transcribed so these genes have a higher recruitment of repair mechanisms i hope i'm being i'm making sense here so genes which are being actively transcribed have a higher rate of repair occurring in them because these are the genes which will form proteins uh, and the book talks about it a bit i think it gets clearer if it's not right now so i talked about direct repair 
so you have a methylation this is a guanine molecule at the sixth so o6 meg so g refers to the guanine me is a methylation a methyl group ch3 is a methyl group and o6 is the sixth uh, is the atom uh, the carbon on the sixth position has an oxygen attached to it so o6 methylation so this is not normal so you have an active methylase mtase is a methylase it has a cysteine and this methyl group is transferred here so this guanine is repaired but this enzyme is now inactive so this is a sort of sacrificial way of repairing dna damage because the dna has been restored but the enzyme is now inactive because of the methylation so it's kind of sacrificial so i'll stop for questions because i know this last part or might have gotten confusing okay is anyone typing no for it no one's typing so either you understood everything or i was so over the top that you understood nothing Behind the explosion, yeah, this is quite quite interesting how it all relates to DNA transcription at the end. I missed the first part. Uh, you can't have guanine dimers. You have pyrimidine dimers. Guanine is not a pyrimidine. yeah you definitely should read more to get familiar with this topic because it is very interesting plus it has a lot of detail which i'm skipping out on i'm not i'm, I'm deliberately not including a lot of lot of the details because that will only lead to confusion right now visualization okay i'll try to look for um videos on the topic videos on teller telomere shortening videos on repair mechanisms if they are available last part about guanine o6 methylation this this is a spontaneous methylation which is occurring on guanine this is not a dimerization a dimerization occurs between two bases the methylation here is spontaneous and it can uh, so there is no dimerization there is no other base binding to it a methylation and a dimerization are different dimerization mostly occurs due to ultraviolet damage <clears throat> is the methylation also due to uv no methylations are usually not due to uv radiation there can be other ways of like how these changes occur but right now it's quite over the syllabus oh yeah yeah um wait like, don't worry about that i i know how hard this can be it was easier for me to understand this because uh i have like the textbook in front of me and stuff like that i did it in a proper lecture and it's harder to express these things over a presentation which is being streamed over discord so i understand why it could be hard for base excision repair let me go back yeah the flipping mechanism only recognizes damaged bases or incorrect ones so this can't recognize incorrect bases because it does, it's not exactly interacting with the opposite strand as well it only recognizes if there's a mismatch sorry not a mismatch a wrong base entirely so uracil so the deaminated c leads to uracil uracil is not supposed to be there in dna at all so it does not care what is on this side if this is a wrong base entirely if it's not supposed to exist on the dna it will remove it simultaneously check both strand or does it check one at a time so there's not one enzyme only there there are multiple enzymes which are acting in tandem but but uh, i'll come back to the transcription part i talked about transcription and uh, we haven't done transcription yet but only one strand of the dna is transcribed the other strand is not transcribed you have a template strand you have so you have coding strands and non coding strand only one strand of the dna is transcribed and that strand gets a lot of the 
sorry replication machinery checking it so the opposite strand is checked less and the strand which is actively transcribed is checked more so one strand is checked more than the other strand so this is dependent on the gene on the chromosome because different genes have different uh, coding strands and non coding strands but without talking about transcription yes you you'll have multiple enzyme systems acting together so checking of both strands is occurring but that is outside of transcription okay now we'll talk about a chemical perspective of of the entire process so the chemical changes in nucleotide almost always lead to the formation of unnatural bases so that's what your uh, ber is detecting unnatural bases if you have uh, deamination of adenine you form hypoxanthine hypoxanthine is not supposed to be there if you have deamination of guanine you have a xanthine xanthine is not supposed to be there if you have deamination of cytosine we talked about this it will be uracil and uracil is not supposed to be there so it always leads to the formation of unnatural dna bases and these are removed uh, if you notice i haven't talked about thymine because thymine does not have an amine group so so thymine is basically uracil instead of this hydrogen you have a ch3 so thy if you notice thymine or uracil has no amine groups there's no d there's no amine group to deaminate so that's why thymine has been left out but a g c all of these once deaminated will lead to unnatural dna bases deamination is just one example there can be other chemical changes occurring you can have hydrolysis uh, depurination which removes your base entirely you can have methylation which was here methylation here which is unnatural anyway this one only talks about only about deamination so it leads to formation of unnatural bases and these unnatural bases can then be excised out so what about uh, replication what about all what if these these changes occurred right before replication you would not have enough time to to repair this and that happens that can happen and so if your uh, imagine a thymine dimer if your dna replication machinery reaches a thymine dimer it will stop there your dna replication machinery does not know how to deal with dna damage the regular machinery cannot deal with dna damage and it leaves and then you have special polymerases these are special polymerases because they can be used to replicate regions of dna damage if there is damage you get these special polymerases to act but these special polymerases can act on these uh, damaged regions but they have a low accuracy and processivity they don't so since there's dna damage on the template strand the special polymerases guesses what could be the strand and it adds a nucleotide according to its wishes so it will guess what could be the nucleotide here and add it on its own so this is a very inaccurate process you don't want this to occur a lot so after it has moved after it has uh, say replicated about 10 20 nucleotides it will leave once the dna damage region so you have a region of damage once the dna damage region has been crossed regular replication machinery will come in and start replicating so it has a low processivity a low processivity means that it will replicate uh, replicate dna at a slower and a much smaller scale you don't want these special polymerases to act on your entire genome if they start acting on your entire genome life would not be possible you want these to act only in very short regions where damage is there you don't want it to occur in normal regions in normal regions you have your regular dna polymerase 3 acting anyway what if you have a double stranded break we saw in all these methods in uh, in ber it needed an opposite template strand if you didn't have a template strand your machinery would never know what base to add here because there's a g here you know you have to add a c 
exactly like the case here without the template strand you would not know what to add you know there's an a here so you'll add an a you know there's a t here so you'll add an a sorry a here you'll add a t you have t here you'll add a you have a here you'll have t you understand the point you need a template strand to repair the opposite strand but what if you have a break in both the strands what if you have a break like this and then what do you do so what you can have is two mechanisms you can have non homologous end joining we'll call this n h e j non homologous end joining or n h e j and homologous recombination so you have double stranded breaks occurring in dna this will lead to loss of nucleotides because you don't know what to add so in n h e j you just remove the ends so you remove this end you remove this end and then you join it it doesn't care about what it could have been and what should have been there what's the correct sequence it just cuts and joins that's why it's non homologous and it's an end joining because it just joins the end so it's like a quick and dirty way to to repair your uh, dsbs so nhej is quick and dirty homologous recombination on the other hand occurs right before dna uh, not dna sorry cells uh, your cell division so if you remember in mitosis you have a sister chromatid formation because of dna replication and one if you have a double stranded break in one on one of the sister chromatids the other sister chromatid could be used to repair this region and how this occurs is due to homologous recombination and so what is homologous recombination again we'll talk about this later right now just know that based on the sister chromatid this region can be repaired accurately so homologous recombination is accurate in repairing double stranded breaks but nhej it it's not accurate because it has no sister chromatid to use it has no template so it just cuts and joins and this is the final slide i know it was a long lecture today but it this is this completes replication and repair and we'll start a new topic next week anyway how does dna repair affect the cell cycle so what if you have dna damage you need time to repair it before your cell cycle is complete so dna repair systems have the ability to delay cell cycles so dna repair systems will come in delay the cell cycle and give it enough time to repair the damage so it allows time for the repair machinery to perform the job and dna damage also increases the synthesis of repair enzymes so in a regular cell you don't have uh, you don't have the synthesis of dna repair enzymes at a higher amount but whenever a dna damage is detected you will increase the synthesis of dna repair enzymes more damage more repair uh, more repair enzymes required that's that's the correlation here the more the dna damage you have the more repair enzyme synthesis you will have so this is just a uh, ku protein heterodimers which can be used during uh, during the cell cycle to repair double stranded breaks in dna what is ku protein what it does how it does is not relevant right now this is this is quite high level of molecular biology which we don't need to get in right now i just added it to show an example of how this process could occur and if you are interested the textbook talks about only it has one short paragraph on the ku protein anyway that's it for today's lecture if you have any questions please put them now i will uh, be answering them Hmm. Oh, there are no questions. That's nice. I'll uh, stop the recording now. Uh, thank you all for attending today's lecture. Uh, next, I'll put up the schedule for next week soon. Thank you. Bye bye.